Welcome to day two. We've talked a lot so far about the impact of research on society, on the collective. But of course, the collective is really a collection of individuals. This morning, we'll take a look at the human side of technology, at individual experiences. We see a need for increased focus on creating technologies that can meet us where we are as individuals, wherever that happens to be, in terms of identity, ability, or societal context. This brings us to the field of human-computer interaction, one of Microsoft's longest-standing research areas, which has led to things like Connect, Smart Assistants, and many other innovative technologies. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of the pioneers in the field, Mary Serwinski, to share some of the latest work to make our interactions with technology more natural, more intuitive, and more empowering. Human-Computer Interaction, or HCI, is a critical part of the design of computing systems. It has formerly been around as a field since the 1960s, though of course the study of human factors predates that time period. Most technology companies that care about their users have HCI researchers as part of their product design process. So it made sense that Microsoft Research, which pushes ahead of the product teams by several years, would also incorporate HCI researchers as new systems are invented and evaluated before they are released to the public. I happen to be the first social scientist hired into Microsoft Research back in 1996 or so. Today, my latest count shows over 70 PhD scientists that identify as HCI researchers worldwide in Microsoft Research. HCI deals with the design, execution, and assessment of computer systems and related phenomena that are for human use. The goal of the discipline is to make sure that the technologies we develop are useful, usable, safe, and enjoyable to interact with for all people so that humans can achieve their tasks, whether that's to get work done, learn, be creative, communicate, or just play. In order to fulfill these goals, tech companies must attempt to understand how people use technologies and build systems based on that knowledge, design or invent efficient, effective, and safe interaction techniques for using new systems, and put people first. People's needs, capabilities, and preferences should come before the technology. The new technology invented should be designed to meet users' needs and requirements first, not the other way around. Why is this important? A good user interface can improve financial outcomes because the experience can increase users' loyalty, trust, and make users happy, ensuring continued interaction with the system. We know this firsthand on my team because we study user emotion and we can see happiness go up when interactions with software allows users to get their work done more effectively. For example, We've seen evidence that users smile significantly more often when good search results come back quickly and users don't have to reformulate their search queries. Happy users come back to use software that pleases them. Most HCI researchers come from a varied background of multidisciplinary and training, including computer science, obviously, psychology, because it studies people and the application of theories and methods, sociology for understanding computer-mediated technology and organizations, and even industrial design, for the design of interactive products like cars, laptops, mobile phones, etc. As technology evolves ever more rapidly, human cognition remains relatively stable. It's important now more than ever to ensure that humans can use and understand the design of new systems as they emerge, especially with the advent of newly automated systems like self-driving cars, robots, and telehealth. How do we as a society leverage HCI to ensure that these systems are designed for human safety, comfort, and well-being. To that end, let's take a tour of some of the labs and researchers we have at MSR, Microsoft Research, working in HCI. I'm super excited to give you a mini tour of HCI in the Redmond Labs here in Building 99. First, we're going to meet Mar Gonzalez Franco. Mar is a principal researcher with the EPIC Research Group. She wonders what spatial computing can tell us about human behavior and how we can expand digital content for immersive experiences. Beyond helping to create new ways of experiencing technology through virtual and augmented reality, Mars' work explores how new devices and technologies impact our perception and behavior. I'm Mar Gonzalez Franco, and this is the EPIC Lab, uh, the Extended Perception Interaction and Cognition Lab. What we do here is we explore the digital content around us and we try to implement new sensory abilities to it. Uh, so that means we study very deeply perception and we study the behaviors that come with the perception that uh, we produce with the new devices. 
So you might think perception and behavior are very far apart. It's a big leap. Uh, but the truth is not. And I think studying behavior without studying per perception is just missing part of it. Uh, because perception, how we perceive the world, is going to change how we behave. And the ecological way to explore how our prototypes are going to affect the lives of millions when they go out uh, is to study both together. We're humans are visual animals, right? It's been traditionally our method of displaying information for um, digital content. It's been through screens and through visual. But uh, we are multisensory animals, and we have evolved to have multisensory experiences, which are far more fulfilling. Um, for example, uh, audio is. Um, it's, we have more precision with audio sometimes on a spatial because we our eyes only look forward and audio is you know all around us so we can hear things that are on our back but we cannot see things that are on our back so it's clearly something that we can enhance uh, our experiences with devices if we think on a holistic way uh, what are the different sensors that humans have so you might ask, why is this important now, right? Computers have been here for a while. And I think there's been a change in paradigm in how we understand computing. Uh, until now, we had screens in front of us. Digital content was inside. Uh, more recently, we're seeing a lot of uh, spatial computing devices that render um, the digital content around us. And that, that's changing a little bit how we're going to interact with the content. And in particular, it's augmenting how we need the sensory abilities to match um, and interact with the content. If we see an, uh, an object in front of us that we can grab, we want to feel that experience, right? It's, it's a sensory motor loop um, that needs to be fulfilled. Um, so I have some prototypes here uh, that I can show you. And I think they will explain a bit more what we mean by aumenting the sensory experience and perception. So I want to start with this one. I love this one. Uh, this is called the Pivot. And, and you, you'll clearly see very easily how it works. But um, imagine, well, now it's in the northern hemisphere, it's apple picking season, right? So imagine you're picking apples inside virtual reality or augmented reality. And as you go for the apple, the pivot comes to you and you just grab it. And it's such a fulfilling experience um, that once you've tried it, it feels empty to go into virtual reality without haptic controllers. So we experiment a lot with these type of things. And we have um, devices that um, basically extrude and will change the uh, normal as you're touching through a surface. Um, and you'll see there are many of them that are controllers that you'll be wearing. But we're also trying to amend the desktop. So this is a new type of fabrication based on aesthetic materials. We just published it in Nature Communication. We're able to reduce a shape display into nine actuators only by changing how we uh, fabricate the materials on top of it. Right. So you, you will touch, for example, uh, a shape and move around and be able to experience a whole shape. And we have also these very cute ones, which are mini robots that come just in time for whatever you want to touch. Um, <clears throat> so all of this is a, a nice set of prototypes. But there is science behind it, right? Uh, there are things we found, uh, for example, like the uncanny valley of haptics that you can go deep into this sensation that you break the illusion because the haptics don't match correctly uh, what you're expecting. We pu publish that in Science Robotics. And I think it's hard sometimes to detach theory from practice, because if you don't learn the theory behind it, um, you will not be able to replicate, right? So many days we're inside, but we also go outside, right? We want to see how these technologies go in the wild. And we study beyond touch, all sort of perception. Uh, behind me, you see a bit of a vestibulator, which will, you know, we used to study vestibular system. But we also study a lot of sound. Because once you are inside the content, sound is spatial, like in real life, which is also a very big change in paradigm compared to using uh, screens. 
and so in that area, I'm working a lot with the team of Soundscape, Microsoft Soundscape. They are enabling blind and low vision people uh, to go around the world and travel with a different form of GPS, which is based on beacons. It's a different form of navigation if you think of uh, the human uh, you know, we were living in forests, we would hear sounds travel towards a source of water, we would hear, uh, and you know, that, that would create a mental map as we were going there so we could return to the origin. And, and more recently, you know, this idea of sound emitting um, systems has been used in modern society, right? Uh, uh, churches, minarets, and mosques produce sound for people to know and locate where they are. So we're trying to do that, but with digital content all around us. I, it would be great if the pharmacy made noise so I could go there and find where the pharmacy is. So we're trying to create that type of experience. In particular, I, I recommend reading this uh, piece we put out in Scientific American just uh, a couple of months back. So there are many of these objects we're thinking like apples that are static, right? But uh, the truth is once you put this on, you might be talking to an avatar, for example. So we work a lot on avatars and we are trying to figure out how people behave with a virtual avatar. And there are so many possible applications that it's even beyond what we can do. For the particular case, uh, you know, all these applications of avatars, but for the particular case of AI, I think we have a duty there, right? Um, the, we're creating synthetic data currently. People are creating, uh, training self-driving cars in environments that have no avatars. So you, you basically have no representation of humans there. In many cases, we're just training, uh, you know, can you stop at this sign or, and we need to have the random behavior of humans also inside there to really have a good digital substitute of real life scenarios. Uh, and it's even more interesting because once you have humans in there, you can trigger actions that would happen very rarely in real life. So you can cover many more scenarios than if you were to record real footage. So synthetic training, I think it's something that uh, is of particular interest for AI and, and the merge of this avatar and, and AI content. Uh, so we have been very strong at releasing libraries for everyone to use, like the Microsoft Rocketbox avatar library. So people around the world are also exploring these ideas of how you interact with this digital content um, and avatars in this case. And we have people in the NIH uh, studying the psychological responses, uh, in Stanford, UCL, you know, universities around the world are using our avatars. So there are, you know, all sorts of applications and we're trying to see where it goes uh, also by providing means for everyone to do research in this area. Let's move on to hear from Teddy Sayed. Teddy's a senior researcher in the RISE group at Microsoft Research and also leads the Future of Wearables team. He looks into the question of how technology allows us to express our identity. We'll join Teddy now to hear more about how smart fabrics and wearables are used to create unique new user interfaces to explore human-computer interaction in new areas, including fashion. My name is Teddy Sayed, and I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. I'm in the RISE group, and I lead the Future of Wearables team. And so what I work on is really about connected textiles, uh, intelligent textiles, wearables, and really anything in between that involves textiles in general. So speaking of textiles, you can think of textiles as you know, stuff that's around you every day. It's in your clothing, it's on the couch you sit on, it's in your gym bag. Really, it's woven into the fabric of everything and everything we do every day. Um, so you can imagine being at home or working from home, you're sitting on a couch, you're using your laptop, you know, you're wearing clothing, there's you know, the couch. All those things have fabric embedded in them and they're all really woven around what we do today. And then when we think of you know, the textile experiences, there's also the social experiences, right? There's the aspect of creativity and expression and the clothing that we wear, the activities that we go to. You can imagine being at a large concert or some really interesting event out in public. Um, but the whole point of this is a lot of it, you know, Clothing and textiles is a part of what we do, and it's really woven into what we do every day. 
So when I talk about smart textiles and intelligent textiles and the connected experiences, what I'm really meaning here is imagine there's some sort of intelligence, some type of sensing, some type of interesting interaction enabled by a textile. Um, so when I think of this entire space of textiles that I've mentioned, you know, I like to think of it as an ocean, right? And there's this whole ocean and we're moving across this ocean. You know, there's many companies, Microsoft, Apple, Google, et cetera, et cetera. We're all trying to move in this ocean. But the problem here is that, you know, the vehicle in which we're moving on this ocean is really a boat, but it's a boat made of car parts. We're using really chunky hardware. We're using, you know, maybe not the most optimized software or hardware experiences. Uh, it's really chunky. And so I like to think of this space as moving forward um, with a boat made of car parts. But what we're really looking for is moving this space forward with boat parts. So we need stuff to be integrated into the fabric. We need gestures to be integrated into the fabric. We need technology really to be woven into what we do in everyday life, which I had mentioned earlier. And this really ties back to Mark Weiser's vision of ubiquitous computing, where you know, computing is woven in, in, into the fabric of everyday life. And so this is really what I mean about smart textiles experiences. What we want to do is make the technology, uh, make that boat better. So how are we going to do that? As I mentioned before, you know, we're in this ocean space and we want to do a lot of work that moves it forward. We want technology to be integrated into the fabric. We want it to be part of the textile. So you can imagine how are we actually going to integrate sensing into fabric because you can imagine there's not going to be cameras available all the time. If we're sitting on a couch at home watching a sports game or a movie and our hands are dirty, what are we going to do? Well, here would be a nice use case of actually having textile sensing integrated. Uh, and in Fabricio, we looked at how do we actually integrate sensing into the fabric, and we came up with a pretty clever way of using machine learning uh, to detect different gestures, whether it's tap or click or even wave. So traditional techniques that you see with camera, we can actually do directly with fabric, which I think is really, really cool. But moving beyond just sensing, one of the other challenges that we have with textiles is that textiles deform, and there's a challenge of deformation. And so what I mean by deformation is imagine you have a sensor directly on your shirt, uh, and if I scrunch it up, this sensor is probably not going to work. So how do we solve that? This is what I mean by deformation. So in this next project you're going to see here, we're actually trying to solve for deformation. And so the first place we solved this for was the pocket, because the pocket is one place where you can put objects in, it deforms quite heavily. And if you can solve for a pocket, you can most likely solve for the shirt in your gym bag that you take out and you put on. So here we're actually using some pretty clever, uh, again, clever techniques with machine learning to detect different objects that go into your pocket. And not just objects, but also uh, gestures as well, which is again, one of the, again going back to the, to the areas of focus for HCI. And last but not least, I haven't really touched upon in the previous two projects, the human side. Right? If you think of this whole space as an ecosystem, right now, this ocean is really being pulled by technology companies, which is something I am you know, not really passionate about. I am passionate about wearables, and we are as well at Microsoft. But this space should be really led by designers, by apparel brands, by the people that actually understand and have history with apparels and textiles. So the idea here with Project Brookdale is can we empower that community to have that experience? Can we create textiles? Can we create APIs? Can we create hardware, software experiences that enable them to then design uh, you know, the experiences that we want in the future? For myself, I don't want to be creating the, the next wearable textile or the next wearable, but I want them to be empowered by the work that we do at Microsoft, which is our goal here. And in Project Brookdale, we ended up going to New York. And the reason why we went to New York is obviously New York is a global fashion hub, uh, and a lot of interesting creative designers live there um, and work there. And so by going there, we want to actually explore what is it like to empower you know, a set of designers with tools, hardware, software to create interesting wearable experiences. And by this, I mean you know, using tattoo sensors, using motion sensors, using lights, all the things that kind of exist today uh, in the space of wearables. Can we design tools for them to empower them? The idea here being, if we want this space to be led by that industry, we need to work with them side by side. HCI, we really focus on the human side as well as the computer side. But when you think of you know, the space of textiles and really the broad space in general, it's really about the people that are working in it um, and the impact that it has on the environment. In the case of textiles, you know, there's a huge environmental impact, impact on the type of textiles we use, um, the waste, how it's manufactured. Now you're adding in an element of intelligence, right? Now there's hardware, there's software involved that does all the computation. So really, there's a whole ecosystem that's evolved uh, in this space. And because we're at such a point now where everything is really new, we can actually define and design for sustainability in mind in the space of intelligent textiles. So whether it's the case of you know, the factory worker who's trying to integrate you know, smart textiles at the apparel level um, to the brand that's actually making it to the end customer as well. So we can design for uh, sustainability in mind, which is one of the really unique uh, really aspects about this space that we're working in at Microsoft Research.
And so coming back to that analogy I described earlier with the boat parts and the car parts, you know, what we're trying to do today is really emphasize building out that better boat, whether it's better sensing through the fabrics, um, sustainable fabrics that are also intelligent to designing better backend systems that take into account the environmental impact. It's really all about the ecosystem uh, in moving forward in this ocean. And that is one of the things I'm really excited about here at Microsoft Research. So obviously this insane vision we have here at Microsoft Research is not just myself, but it's a whole team of us at the Future of Wearables Lab. First off, it's led by Evelina Barhudran, who is a co-innovator as well as the leader of business development and strategy for myself and the team, uh, as well as Becky Gangnon and Gabrielle Damon, who handle a lot of the engineering as well as industrial design. Uh, as well, I have some amazing academic collaborators, Taeyeon Wu, who's a PhD student out of Dartmouth College, as well as a supervisor and a colleague of mine and close friend, Dr. Zingdong Yang, uh, also out of Dartmouth College. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to the Microsoft Research Hardware Lab, who does amazing, amazing work here, moving this vision forward. So before I leave you today, I kind of want to leave you with a nice quote um, from Walter Benjamin, who's a personal favorite of mine. Work on good prose has three steps. A musical stage, when it is composed, an architectonic one, when it is built, and textile one, when it is woven. So Microsoft Research, we're composing a lot of the components you've seen today. You know, we're trying to make that boat better. Um, we're building all the necessary software and infrastructure for it. But really what it comes down to, especially you as the audience and looking for collaborators as well, is weaving this all together through textiles. So if you're someone who's interested in smart textiles, um, connected experiences through you know, um, jerseys or, or areas like that, um, or even really just interested in wearables in general, please get in touch and let's collaborate because that's really what we're all about at Microsoft Research. Up next, you're going to meet Anne Paradiso. Anne is a principal research designer in the Enable Group here at Microsoft Research, and she works to pair human-centered design and technology to enable expression and creativity. The Enable Group creates technologies that improve the lives of people with disabilities. Community is one important aspect to the group's work, so they design new technology with users, not just for users. I'm Anne Paradiso, and I am a research designer at MSR, and I'm sitting here in the Enable Lab in Redmond. One of the things that I care deeply about and that I know all of my collaborators care deeply about is that gap between what happens in a research lab or in this lab or in a development environment and getting technologies that are critical into the hands of users who can use them and benefit from them. We have several collaborators inside of Microsoft who have different skill sets that when we combine them together, we find we can be uh, more effective as a team. Expressive Pixels is a technology-mediated creativity toolkit. It's the result of a long-standing collaboration among the Enable Group and Central Engineering teams at MSR Redmond and the Microsoft Small, Medium, and Corporate Business Team. The platform embodies our shared belief that expression through technology, art, and communication should be an empowering experience for all. Expressive Pixels can be paired with a variety of inclusive inputs and LED displays to enable all sorts of novel alternative avenues for creative expression and communication. Here's a short introduction to the platform by Expressive Pixels co-creator, Gavin Jenke. Hi, I'm Gavin, and I'm excited to share with you Microsoft Expressive Pixels, a fun new app that provides an inclusive experience for people with all abilities to express, connect, and share with others. Expressive Pixels originally came about from a desire to provide a means of expression. For some people, verbal expressions may be challenging, whether because of speech disabilities or they are just less comfortable with it. Often, a visual statement through creative and artistic expression can communicate as much or more than words can ever say. The result takes into account neurodiversity in lowering barriers. With Expressive Pixels, you can create your own animations or use animations from our online community gallery and make them come alive on simple LED display devices. Microsoft Expressive Pixels can be downloaded for free from the Microsoft Store on your PC. Download the app today. Start creating and expressing yourself. You can learn more by watching the tutorial videos on our website aka.ms forward slash expressive pixel. You'd think it would be obvious if you were going to do design work or R&D, incubation work, innovation work, or whatever, that you would understand the community that you're designing for. It's not always obvious. Our mission at Microsoft is to empower every human and organization on the planet to achieve more. 
So that word every is really where we focus. That means every human, not not just humans who don't have hard problems to solve. When you build relationships uh, like we do with our creative collaborators and with our, our community, you're invested. You're deeply, deeply invested in their well-being as your friend, your collaborator, and your fellow human being. And so that sense of investment, purpose, and empathy is what keeps everybody, that's the glue. That sense of, of purpose, that sense of common purpose, is the connective tissue for all of us working in this space. Music is a primitive and powerful means of human communication and expression. Through it, we can share emotions, experiences, and meanings with people across cultures and languages, and even across time. For the last five years, we've been experimenting with a number of approaches to inclusive music in support of people with little to no motor ability who may also be experiencing speech loss. The projects I'm going to show you next share one primary input constraint. They have to be able to be played using just the eyes. That is, no speech, no other movement. The Hands Free Music Project is an ongoing collaboration between Microsoft, local musicians, and the ALS community. It includes a suite of eye-controlled instruments and playing interfaces to support composition, performance, and live collaborations. We are Dangerfield Newbie. That was the day my world was turned upside down. That was when I was diagnosed with ALS. Uh, obviously a lot of negatives here, um, but it's been very interesting to see um, some amazing things occur in the aftermath. Cyclops is an eye-controlled instrument designed by music technologist Willie Payne during his summer internship with the Enable Experiences group here in MSR. Willie built the Cyclops to support improvisation and performance scenarios for musicians who only have control over their eyes. And yes, Willie is doing his entire demo using just his eyes. The Cyclops has three main screens, instrument, sequence, and audio effects. The instrument page is the primary page for producing sounds. Tiny red dot is where the eye tracker detects my eye gaze. When I stare long enough at a button on the screen, it will cause it to press playing a sound. The sequence tab contains extra controls for playing with the loop. We can change the tempo to affect the speed of the music. We can add accents to increase the volume of individual notes, or rests to silence portions of the loop. On the effects page, we can fine tune how our sound actually sounds. With just a few controls, the Cyclops is an expressive instrument capable of a wide range of sounds all controlled and triggered just with your eyes. To me, one of the best ways to learn is to do. And the way that you learn uh, how you can best serve a user community who is facing profound constraints due to ability loss because of disease progression is to meet them listen to them, observe them, and you know, take part in as many activities as we can because experiential observation is super critical, especially when you're trying to decide where you're going to focus your efforts. Our space in general, um, we, we do a combination of things. We do formal, 
fundamental research in computer science, write papers, conduct studies, create prototypes, proofs of concepts, evaluate them, and release those findings into the world so that we can better inform the design of assistive and expressive technologies in the future. We also incubate our own designs and technologies, and we work iteratively and collaboratively with our user community to direct those activities. We are honest about what we learn. We put everything out um, in the open source or in the public domain. We share, uh, we mentor students, we mentor talent. We, we do all of those activities because that is how the progress is going to happen. What way can we use technology in service to our goal of restoring or reinventing lost capability. If you don't center your user community in every single activity, every single research, design, or development or innovation activity that you have, you will not be successful. Finally, we'll hear from Ken Hinckley, a senior principal researcher who's also from the Epic Group. Ken is going to talk with us about how devices can help to make sense out of our increasingly complex work lives and interactions with others. He's worked on everything from sensing techniques, cross-device interaction, to novel device form factors. Today, he's going to tell you a little bit about Surface Fleet. This technology has implications for something many of us can relate to these days, the home workspace. I'm Ken Hinckley. Um, I work here at the Lab Microsoft Research. Uh, we innovate across hardware, software, and the human experience. Um, we do all kinds of cool research in terms of interaction with devices and also studying how people use devices and also interact with one another. Um, so we study collaboration, we study how people do, you know, work in productivity, uh, we study how they actually use their devices in terms of just picking things up, looking at them, moving them around, all this kind of stuff. So we have lots of, you know, very fun things that we do. Uh, one of the, you know, exciting areas that we work in a lot is, you know, sort of figuring out how to leverage smarts about the world around us. So bringing in things like sensors or, you know, sort of unusual inputs like speech or gaze or, you know, camera inputs, that kind of thing, uh, to have a more natural way of working with our devices. The actual name EPIC is an acronym, right? So it stands for Extended Perception, Interaction, and Cognition. Um, so we work across all these topics. So the perception is the human perception of how they see the world, how they feel the world, how they hear the world. Uh, the interaction, of course, is you know interacting with things around you, moving things like even just a simple mouse or picking up a device, that's an interaction. Looking at someone, that's an interaction. You might not think of it that way. Uh, but if our computers and devices can sense these things and respond to them appropriately, uh, it makes it so they can be much smarter about how they interpret you know, what we're doing in the world. Um, and then the cognition part is ties into you know not so much artificial intelligence but actual human you know, genuine intelligence right um, and how people think about you know the world their tasks um, how they think about interacting with one another uh, and a lot of this is it's not just in your brain but it's actually externalized to the world so it um, you know the, so the E in Epic stands for this you know this externalization or this extended nature of intelligence where your artifacts in the world actually encode information and you so you don't have to remember something you just stick it on a post-it note and you stick it on your monitor and that's you know, externalizing that reminder. Um, so that, that's sort of the whole scope of the research in the group. Um, so for example, we do, you know, we've contributed to the new future work in terms of studying like what people do with their devices while they're working at home, what kind of tasks are they doing, how are they juggling tasks with their kids and their families and their uh, multiple clients and all these things. Um, we work across um, things like, you know, haptic feedback, for example. So devices that can actually respond to you with, um, you can feel tactily, you know, what's going on in terms of, um, you know, if you're interacting with the virtuality, you can feel objects in the world, uh, you can feel the shape of things, maybe if you're not, uh, if you're a person who's not sighted. Um, so we do, do all kinds of things in, along those lines. So we're, we're kind of hurtling towards this future where everyone has these multiple screens and multiple devices all around them. Uh, and this is a trend that's been particularly, you know, aggravated by this, you know, new future of work that we find ourselves in, uh, where suddenly we're working at home, you know, you've got your screen there, maybe you've got your kid's iPad there, you know, maybe you've got another computer at, at the at the ready, um, and you're you're just trying to you know, get your work done across all these devices, um, and so and it's it's not unlike how people might work you know in an office space where they're spreading out uh, information across uh, multiple pieces of paper. They're trying to you know lay out their thoughts, you know organize things in kind of this informal way of putting things in space. 
Um, and so multiple devices can serve this same role. So in a sense, people, you know, they like to use space to think. Uh, and so we like to think of ways to do that in the digital world as well. The main idea of Surface Suite is to make it easy to work across these multiple devices. Uh, and sort of the objective is to make it easy to transition, you know, whatever activity you're working on from one device to another, or uh, from one location to another, or even to pass it off to another person, or to, to defer it to a future time when you're actually ready to work on it. Uh, so having both technologies and user experiences that speak to that uh, is something that we're looking at very closely. Um, so in particular today, I can talk a bit about something we're doing called the uh, Ultimate Flexible Workspace, which is a device concept we've been exploring, which makes us you can just walk up to your, your, your workstation at home uh, with your tablet. You just plop it into this armature that's kind of like an articulated lamp, and then you can kind of posture your tablet anywhere in space. Uh, and then the really cool thing is when you have multiple of these, they're all aware of one another. You can sort of juxtapose them. You can split them apart. You can put one down, one up. Um, so you know, just depending on your task and what you're trying to do and what information you want to see side by side, it makes it super easy to dynamically create these formations of devices. Because it also senses these transitions, all you have to do is put the device next to another one and it says like, hey, you want your document here? And then you can just drag it over or you know, whatever you want to do. So it, it makes it really easy to work in these kind of ad hoc workspaces that we have in our homes where often you know, space is very limited. Uh, you might have multiple screens, but you're just, you're kind of in this little, you know, sort of improvised desks in the corner of your living room somewhere, right? So uh, making it really easy to work in those kind of spaces, which you know, also could translate to the future when we get back to the office uh, and we're sharing spaces and, and conference rooms and so forth. So in particular, um, last year, which is actually during this you know, pandemic remote work time, uh, we had a visiting researcher by the name of Nick Marquardt, uh, who's a professor at Univers University College London, uh, also happens to be a former intern who worked with me you know, over 10 years ago now. Um, and so Nick and I have sort of done a number of projects over the year, and he had this brainstorm about you know, basically repurposing articulated lamps as a smart uh, appliance, you know, desk appliance you know, for the, for the work at home situation. Um, so the idea is that you basically take, you know, we literally ordered these arbitrators off of Amazon, I think, right? Um, so they're like 20 bucks, uh, just added some sensors to them, which are just, you know, they're basically just simple motion sensors. It's the same as you would have in your smartphone or tablet already. Uh, put a bunch of those on the, you know, the different armature uh, links there. Uh, and then we can actually sense where the tablet is in space. So as you you know position it, you can let go of it. It just stays there. It knows its angle. It knows its position. It knows how it's postured relative to you. You can put it over next to another device. If that one also has an armature, uh, then that one also can know where it is relative to the other. So they have this kind of spatial sense of like who's nearby, just like you would be aware of if someone walked up behind you or next to you, uh, you could collaborate with them. So in that, in that sense, your devices are spatially aware. They're aware of one another. Uh, and they can pre present these opportunities to just easily move documents or pieces of work or uh, to take the input or camera from one device and kind of access it on another. Uh, so it makes it really easy to work in this sort of multi-device, multi-screen future that we see ourselves moving towards in terms of technology trends as well as the experiences that people want to have with all these different screens in their lives. Right, so when people are you know, in these spaces where they're working across their digital content, Often we have these very you know complex sort of knowledge work type tasks we're doing where there's you know, you're trying to get insights from across multiple documents across different sites on the web. So you're trying to bring these together uh, into new artifacts that you're creating for you know here's my idea here's my report here's my presentation. Um, so and this is you know it's cognitively demanding work. So just being limited to one little screen to do that is just doesn't work so well. Uh, and particularly people, we find more and more are co-opting device, other devices they already have into this. So, and, and it goes beyond just um, you know, documents. So for example, if I'm in a teleconference call, I might want to have the document up on one screen, and I might put the camera on my mobile phone, which is somewhere else, so it gets the right camera angle. I can still see the content that I'm talking about, and I can divide that across multiple devices. You know, or say someone sends me a, um, you know, a contract to sign, right? I don't want to take that and try to sign it on a big monitor. I want to take that, put it on my tablet. I use the pen there to handwrite it or annotate the document if it's something more, or maybe I sketch up an idea there, and then I want to get it back onto my big screen to do the work there. Um, so people like being able to extend their workspaces mix and match sort of the, the, the best of each device that they have, so they kind of leverage those strengths uh, and use their multiple screens and multiple devices with all these different capabilities to complement one another to kind of get more work done, think more clearly about what they're doing, and just kind of have that great idea.